In this lecture, we're going to be learning about speciation. And you know, on this slide, for example, I've got all of the orders of insects. And it's really amazing the diversification that has happened in insects since their common ancestor. And you can see, you know, we have that similar body plan of three body parts, six legs, one pair of antennae. Most of them have wings. Um, but there's such a huge diversification that has happened, and this diversification happened via the process of speciation. So the question of, well, what is a species then becomes important. Species um, concepts were developed in order to define how you could describe what a species is and what a species is not. And perhaps one of the earliest and, and the most popular for many, many years is the biological species concept. This was developed by Ernst Meyer in 1942, and the basic criteria here is that as long as po two populations are reproductively isolated, then those two populations should be considered as separate species. He even said, quote, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. Now this concept is powerful in that it really has a nice um, intuitive description of what two species, you know, what two separate populations, um, whether to define whether or not they are two separate species or still the same species. However, there are some disadvantages with this, with this species concept as well. So first, the advantage is though that it is a wonderful criteria to confirm the lack of gene flow because it's embedded within its definition. But the disadvantages are that it's very difficult to apply operationally. Now perhaps on you know, a group of elephants this is not that big of a deal because you can track each individual elephant, see which elephant is reproducing with which elephant and so forth. But you know, if you tried to track fruit flies in the Hawaiian rainforest, you know, that's a little bit more difficult to do. Also this species concept only applies to sexual or contemporary populations. right? Because the definition is based upon the lack of gene flow, well, how do, you, how do you measure that for individuals who are asexual, like bacteria, who are simply just you know, dividing through binary fission? Or how do you do this for populations which have gone extinct? So for fossil organisms, how do you do this, right? It doesn't matter how much you rub, rub two rocks together, you know, you're not gonna make little rock babies. So, it doesn't work for sexual or contemporary populations. And the other issue is what do you, how do you deal with populations that live in different places, so therefore they are potentially interbreeding, but if they never do come together, right? So if you brought offspring together in the lab and they do reproduce, does that mean they're the same species or not the same species? So it brings up a lot of questions. There's, it's not black or white. There's a little bit of gray area here. And, and how much reproductive isolation is necessary, right? To, to say, okay, now we have a lack of gene flow. And then there's also, even within um, sexually reproducing populations, you also have this issue of hybridization, which is very prevalent in plants. So this, this species concept has been very useful in the past, but there are some new concepts and um, combination of, of multiple concepts that may be more appropriate, especially as we get into our, this new genomic age. Nonetheless, this, this species concept does set up a nice a model for us to work within. So I like this diagram here. It shows that if you have individuals of um, two separate individuals, perhaps from two different populations, there are barriers that can um, uh, basically be introduced to inhibit gene flow. And some of these barriers can be prezygotic barriers. In other words, they happen before the zygote is made. So I'm going to talk about five of these. And then there are two barriers that can happen after the zygote has been formed, so after fertilization. There, among the prezygotic barriers, there are three of these that even can occur before mating even occurs. The first is called temporal isolation. And this is the fact that maybe the two individuals are simply just not reproductively active at the same time. Like flowers could be living in the same field, but if one flower is only um, flowering during May and the other one is only flowering during June, then you will not get the cross fertilization there in, in order to um, you won't have fertilization in order to um, have a successful um, mating. 
Likewise, you could have habitat isolation. So this is where, I don't know, these two flowers are on different continents. And so even if they're flowering at the exact same time, but they're in different areas, then they're not going to be able to reproduce. There's also the issue of behavioral isolation. And this is where there's just simply no um, attraction between the two individuals. For example, in insects, this is common. Insects, many insects use pheromones, which is a chemical that is emitted by one of the species, typically the female, and then the male um, hones in on that chemical using its antenna to find the female. Well, if the male does, is not attracted to the particular pheromone, then it does not, um, does not search out the female to mate with her. If mating does occur, though, that may not mean that you still have a successful fertilization. The first barrier that might be there is a mechanical isolation. This is also a good example in insects. Because insects have an exoskeleton, all of their external genitalia is, is hardened and, and sclerotized, and so it doesn't change shapes. And it's been described that many insects um, need to have this kind of lock and key mechanism, where the male genitalia fits inside of the female genitalia just like a lock and a key. And if you don't have the right shapes, then things don't fit right. Um, another type of prezygotic barrier that can occur after mating is gametic isolation. And this is the, even if there was a mating copulation occurred and there were, uh, you know, and it, the sperm come in contact with the eggs, it may be that they fail to actually unite in a fertilization event. Now, if you get through those first five barriers, then you have a mating and a successful fertilization. That does not mean that they are still the same species because you could have hybrid inviability. This is where the hybrid zygotes fail to develop. So, you know, it could result in things like um, early miscarriages or you just, the, the organism never reaches sexual maturity. Likewise, you could also have hybrid sterility where the organism does live, um, the the offspring does live, but the hybrids fail to produce functional gametes, so they're just unable to reproduce themselves. But if these two individuals can make it through each of these barriers and have viable fertile offspring, then we would still consider those individuals to be the same species under the biological species concept model. So some of the other species concept models are like more the morphological species concept model. This is also a species concept that has been in, in play for many, many years, and it's simply based on the differences and similarities of the organisms. The advantages to this concept is that it is widely applicable. In fact, almost all forms of life, including fossils, can be, in, can be um, uh, looked at inside of this species concept. However, it does have some disadvantages as well. The definitions are always a little bit arbitrary and authoritative. Right? It's like the expert of mayflies is the person who decides how many species of mayflies there are going to be. And then there are these issues. For, many, for some organisms, there are simply just no morphological variation, like these nematodes or roundworms. They all basically look like a little worm with a mouth and an anus and, and nothing else. And so if there's no morphological variation, then how can you determine what one species is and what another species is under the morphological species concept? Many species are also cryptic, meaning they hide, and so you never see them. If you don't see them, you don't see their morphology. Many species have um, sexual dimorphism, where the female and the male look very different. So to, you know, the, if you were to just come and see these two spiders, you might think, oh, there's two different species there, when in reality there is only one species. And finally, some species are polymorphic. So this is an, a really interesting example. I always ask students, how many species would you propose are, in, are being represented by this graph of these butterflies here. And many times the, spe the students say seven because you have these two look alike, these two look alike, these two look alike, and so forth. It turns out that there's actually only two species. This entire column is one species with seven different morph types, and this is another column of, of one, sp this is another species of seven different morph types, and they happen to have seven types that mimic each other. An the, another species concept that is becoming more and more widely accepted is the phylogenetic species concept. And this concept is based upon the idea of using phylogenetics, which is the science of creating an evolutionary tree to represent relationships, and you look for natural groups on this phylogenetic tree. So you end up drawing kind of circles around branches, and that circle becomes a species. 
because they possess genetic and morphologically diagnosable characters that are unique to that group only. Now, this has been done in a multitude of different or, um, organisms, and one popular example are elephants. For many years, the leading idea was that there were only two species of elephants, the Asian elephants and the African elephants. But it turns out that if you use a phylogenetic analysis, based both upon its genetic and morphological characters, that the Asian elephants still group into a group by themselves, so you can draw a circle easily around the Asian elephants. The African forest elephants form a group, and the African savanna elephants form a group. So the phylogenetic species concept most um, supports a, the hypothesis that there are three species of extant elephants. There are advantages, again, to the phylogenetic species concept. It's applicable to all types of organisms, sexual and asexual, and also fossils. It's also testable and quantitative, so it gets rid of some of that arbitrary, you know, authoritative nature of the morphological species concept. And it provides a very good non-trivial classification system, which is what we want. We want a classification system that represents the underlying evolutionary history of the organisms. The disadvantages are, though, that it's still a little bit arbitrary. I mean, where do you draw the circles? Although there are some good methods in play that are, that are getting rid of this arbitrariness as well. Putting it into practice can be complicated, expensive, and time-consuming. I know, I've done a lot, some of this, and it takes a long time. And also, the phylogenies can change as you add additional taxa or data. So some scientists don't like the idea that the phylogenetic species concept is constantly being revised, and so it changes what we call species all of the time. Um, and the last disadvantage is that many uh, people have argued that this is going to increase the number of species. Now, speciation happens because we remember we're dividing the populations into two separate populations and then there are barriers are being placed in between these populations. And so we basically look at this in the way of two modes of speciation. The first is called allopatric speciation. This is where a geographic barrier divides a population into two separate populations. So, you know, this ravine here was created from this original um, population, and so now you've got two separate populations that are now evolving on their own evolutionary <coughs> history, and so they begin to diverge from each other. <coughs> the second type of speciation is called sympatric speciation, and this is where um, a, a barrier is produced without Ge without a geography barrier being the reason. Usually this is some form of genetic barrier that, that causes the new species to come about.